Warren Earl Berger September 17, 1907 to June 25, 1995, was the 15th Chief Justice of the United States, serving from 1969 to 1986. Born in St. Paul, Minnesota, Berger graduated from the St. Paul College of Law in 1931. He helped secure the Minnesota delegation's support for Dwight D. Eisenhower at the 1952 Republican National Convention. After Eisenhower won the 1952 presidential election, he appointed Berger to the position of Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Division. In 1956, Eisenhower appointed Berger to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Berger served on this court until 1969 and became known as a critic of the Warren Court. In 1969, President Richard Nixon nominated Berger to succeed Chief Justice Earl Warren, and Berger won Senate confirmation. He did not emerge as a strong intellectual force on the court, but sought to improve the administration of the federal judiciary. He also helped establish the National Center for State Courts and the Supreme Court Historical Society. Berger remained on the court until his retirement in 1986, when he became chairman of the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution. He was succeeded as Chief Justice by William H. Rehnquist, who had served as an Associate Justice since 1971. In 1974, Berger wrote for a unanimous court in United States v. Nixon, which rejected Nixon's invocation of executive privilege in the wake of the Watergate scandal. The ruling played a major role in Nixon's resignation. Berger joined the majority in Roe v. Wade in holding that the right to privacy prohibited states from banning abortions. He later abandoned Roe v. Wade and Thornburg v. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. His majority opinion in Inns v. Chada struck down the one-house legislative veto. Although Berger was a conservative, and the Berger Court delivered numerous conservative decisions, the Berger Court also delivered some liberal decisions regarding abortion, capital punishment, religious establishment, and school desegregation during his tenure. Early years Warren Earl Berger was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, in 1907, as one of seven children. His parents, Catherine Schnitger and Charles Joseph Berger, a traveling salesman and railroad cargo inspector, were of Austrian-German descent. His grandfather, Joseph Berger, had emigrated from Tyrol, Austria and joined the Union Army when he was 12. Joseph Berger fought and was wounded in the Civil War, resulting in the loss of his right arm and was awarded the Medal of Honor at the age of 14. Joseph Berger by age 16 became the youngest captain in the Union Army. Berger grew up on the family farm near the edge of St. Paul. He attended John A. Johnson High School, where he was president of the Student Council. He competed in hockey, football, track, and swimming. While in high school, he wrote articles on high school sports for local newspapers. He graduated in 1925. That same year, Berger also worked with the crew building the Robert Street Bridge, a crossing of the Mississippi River in St. Paul that still exists. Concerned about the number of deaths on the project, he asked that a net be installed to catch anyone who fell, but was rebuffed by managers. In later years, Berger made a point of visiting the bridge whenever he came back to town. Topic education and early career Berger attended night school at the University of Minnesota while selling insurance for mutual life insurance. Afterward, he enrolled at St. Paul College of Law, later became William Mitchell College of Law, now Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, receiving his Bachelor of Laws Magna Cum Laude in 1931. He took a job at the firm of Boyenson, Otis and Pharisee, now known as Moore, Costello and Hart. In 1937, Berger served as the 8th president of the St. Paul Jaycees. He also taught for 12 years at William Mitchell. Politics Berger was a lifelong Republican. His political career began uneventfully, but he soon rose to national prominence. He supported Minnesota Governor Harold E. Stassen's unsuccessful pursuit of the Republican nomination for president in 1948. In 1952, at the Republican convention, he played a key role in Dwight D. Eisenhower's nomination by delivering the Minnesota delegation. 
After he was elected, President Eisenhower appointed Berger as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Division of the Justice Department. In this role, he first argued in front of the Supreme Court. The case involved John P. Peters, a Yale University professor who worked as a consultant to the government. He had been discharged from his position on loyalty grounds. Supreme Court cases are usually argued by the Solicitor General, but he disagreed with the government's position and refused to argue the case. Berger lost the case. Shortly after, Berger appeared in a case defending the United States against claims from the Texas City ship explosion disaster, successfully arguing that the Federal Tort Claims Act of 1947 did not allow a suit for negligence in policy making. The United States won the case Dale Height, et al. v. United States 346 U.S. 15, 1953. <laughs> Court of Appeals Service Berger was nominated by President Dwight D. Eisenhower on January 12, 1956, to a seat on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit vacated by Judge Harold M. Stevens. He was confirmed by the United States Senate on March 28, 1956, and received his commission on March 29, 1956. His service terminated on June 23, 1969, due to his elevation to the Supreme Court. National prominence In 1968, Chief Justice Earl Warren announced his retirement after 15 years on the court, effective on the confirmation of his successor. President Lyndon Johnson nominated sitting Associate Justice Abe Fortas to the position, but a Senate filibuster blocked his confirmation. With Johnson's term as president about to expire before another nominee could be considered, Warren remained in office. Supreme Court service Berger was nominated by President Richard Nixon on May 23, 1969, to a seat on the Supreme Court of the United States vacated by Chief Justice Earl Warren. In his presidential campaign, Nixon had pledged to appoint a strict constructionist as Chief Justice. Berger had first caught Nixon's eye through a letter of support the former sent to Nixon during the 1952 fund crisis, and then again 15 years later when the magazine U.S. News & World Report had reprinted a 1967 speech that Berger had given at Ripon College. In it, Berger compared the United States judicial system to those of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. I assume that no one will take issue with me when I say that these North European countries are as enlightened as the United States in the value they place on the individual and on human dignity. Those countries do not consider it necessary to use a device like our Fifth Amendment, under which an accused person may not be required to testify. They go swiftly, efficiently and directly to the question of whether the accused is guilty. No nation on earth goes to such lengths or takes such pains to provide safeguards as we do, once an accused person is called before the bar of justice and until his case is completed. Through speeches like this, Berger became known as a critic of Chief Justice Warren and an advocate of a literal, strict constructionist reading of the U.S. Constitution. Nixon's agreement with these views, being expressed by a readily confirmable, sitting federal appellate judge, led to the nomination. He was confirmed by the United States Senate on June 9, 1969, and received his commission on June 23, 1969. Earl Warren swore in the new Chief Justice the same day. He assumed senior status on September 26, 1986. His service terminated on June 25, 1995, due to his death. According to President Nixon's memoirs, he had asked Justice Berger in the spring of 1970 to be prepared to run for president in 1972 if the political repercussions of the Cambodia invasion were too negative for him to endure. A few years later, in 1971 and 1973, Berger was on Nixon's short list of vice presidential replacements for Vice President Spiro Agnew, along with John Connolly, Ronald Reagan, and Nelson Rockefeller before Gerald Ford was appointed following Agnew's resignation in October 1973. <laughs> Chief Justice Topic. Jurisprudence 
When Berger was nominated for the chief justiceship, conservatives in the Nixon administration expected that the Berger court would rule markedly differently from the Warren court and might, in fact, overturn controversial Warren court era precedents. By the early 1970s, however, it became apparent that the Berger court was not going to reverse the rulings of the Warren court and in fact might extend some Warren court doctrines. The court issued a unanimous ruling, Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education 1971, supporting busing to reduce de facto racial segregation in schools. In United States v. U.S. District Court 1972, the Berger Court issued another unanimous ruling against the Nixon administration's desire to invalidate the need for a search warrant and the requirements of the Fourth Amendment in cases of domestic surveillance. Then, only two weeks later in Furman v. Georgia 1972, the court, in a 5-4 decision, invalidated all death penalty laws then in force, although Berger dissented from the decision. In the most controversial ruling of his term, Roe v. Wade 1973, Berger voted with the majority to recognize a broad right to privacy that prohibited states from banning abortions. However, Berger abandoned Roe v. Wade by the time of Thornburg v. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. On July 24, 1974, Berger led the court in a unanimous decision in United States v. Nixon. This was President Nixon's attempt to keep several memos and tapes relating to the Watergate affair private. As documented in Woodward and Armstrong's The Brethren and elsewhere, Berger's original feelings on the case were that Watergate was merely a political battle, he didn't see what they did wrong. The actual final opinion was largely Justice Brennan's work, though each justice wrote at least a rough draft of a particular section. Berger was originally to vote in favor of Nixon, but tactically changed his vote in order to assign the opinion to himself, and to restrain the opinion's rhetoric. Berger's first draft of the opinion wrote that executive privilege could be invoked when it dealt with a core function of the presidency, that in some cases the executive could be supreme. However, the other justices in the Supreme Court were able to convince Berger to excise that language from the opinion. The judicial branch alone would have the power to determine whether something qualifies to be shielded under executive privilege. Berger was opposed to gay rights as he wrote a famous concurring opinion in the court's 1986 decision upholding a Georgia law criminalizing sodomy, Bowers v. Hardwick, in which Berger relied on historical evidence that laws criminalizing homosexuality were of ancient vintage. Chief Justice Berger pointed out that the famous legal author William Blackstone wrote that sodomy was a crime against nature of deeper malignity than rape, a heinous act the very mention of which is a disgrace to human nature and a crime not fit to be named. Berger also emphasized the maintenance of checks and balances between the branches of government. In the 1983 case of Immigration and Naturalization Service v. Chada, he held, for the majority, that Congress could not reserve a legislative veto over executive branch actions. On issues involving criminal law and procedure, Berger remained reliably conservative. He joined the court majority in voting to reinstate the death penalty in Gregg v. Georgia 1976, and, in 1983, he vigorously dissented from the court's holding in the case of Solem v. Helm that a sentence of life imprisonment for issuing a fraudulent check in the amount of $100 constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Leadership Rather than dominating the court, Berger sought to improve administration both within the court and within the nation's legal system. Criticizing some advocates as unprepared, Berger created training venues for state and local government advocates. He also helped found the National Center for State Courts, which is now located in Williamsburg, Virginia, as well as the Institute for Court Management, and National Institute of Corrections to provide professional training for judges, clerks, and prison guards. Berger also began a tradition of annually delivering a state of the judiciary speech to the American Bar Association, many members of which had been alienated by the Warren Court. However, some detractors thought his emphasis on the mechanics of the judicial system trivialized the office of Chief Justice. Berger drew internal controversy within the Supreme Court throughout his tenure, as was revealed in the controversial, though best selling book, Woodward and Armstrong's The Brethren. Although Senator Everett Dirksen noted Berger, looked, sounded, and acted like a Chief Justice. 
The reporters depicted Berger as a weak chief justice who was not seriously respected by his colleagues due to alleged personal eccentricity and lack of legal acumen. Woodward and Armstrong's sources indicated that some of the other justices were annoyed by Berger's practice of switching his vote in conference, or simply not announcing his vote, in order that he be able to control opinion assignments. Berger repeatedly irked his colleagues by changing his vote to remain in the majority, and by rewarding his friends with choice assignments and punishing his foes with dreary ones. Berger would also try to influence the course of events in a case by circulating a preemptive opinion. Consequently, the Berger court was described as his in name only. Time magazine called him plotting and standoffish, as well as pompous, aloof, and unpopular. Berger was a constant irritant on the court's group dynamic, according to the New York Times' Linda Greenhouse. Jeffrey Tubin wrote in his book The Nine that by the time of his departure in 1986, Berger had alienated all of his colleagues to one degree or another. In particular, Potter Stewart, who had been considered a candidate to follow Warren as Chief Justice, was so discontented with Berger that he became the primary source for Woodward and Armstrong when writing The Brethren. Greenhouse points to the case of Immigration and Naturalization Service v. Chada as evidence of Berger's foundering leadership. Berger would cause the case to be delayed for over 20 months, despite there having been five votes to affirm the appeals court's finding of unconstitutionality after the case was first argued, Brennan, Marshall, Blackman, Powell, and Stevens. Berger did not allow an opinion to be assigned, first by asking for a special conference on the case, and then by delaying the case for re-argument when that conference fell through even though he never held a formal vote on holding the case over for re-argument. Later life Berger retired on September 26, 1986, in part to lead the campaign to mark the 1987 bicentennial of the United States Constitution, at which time he commissioned the construction of the Constitution Bicentennial Monument the National Monument to the U.S. Constitution. He had served longer than any other Chief Justice appointed in the 20th century. Despite his reputation for being imperious, he was beloved by the law clerks and judicial fellows who worked with him. In 1987, Princeton University's American Whig Cleosophic Society awarded Berger the James Madison Award for Distinguished Public Service. In 1988, he was awarded the prestigious United States Military Academy's Sylvanus Thayer Award as well as the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 1991 appearance on the McNeil, Lehrer Newshour, Berger stated that the Second Amendment has been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, on the American public by special interest groups. Berger died in his sleep on June 25, 1995, from congestive heart failure at the age of 87, at Sibley Memorial Hospital in Washington, D.C. He drafted his own one-page will. All of his papers were donated to the College of William and Mary, where he had served as Chancellor, however, they will not be open to the public until 2026. Berger's casket lay in repose in the Great Hall of the United States Supreme Court Building. His remains are interred at Arlington National Cemetery. Legacy As Chief Justice, Berger was instrumental in founding the Supreme Court Historical Society and was its first president. Berger is often cited as one of the foundational proponents of Alternative Dispute Resolution ADR, particularly in its ability to ameliorate an overloaded justice system. In a speech given in front of the American Bar Association, Justice Berger lamented the state of the justice system in 1984. Our system is too costly, too painful, too destructive, too inefficient for a truly civilized people. To rely on the adversary process as the principal means of resolving conflicting claims is a mistake that must be corrected. The Warren E. Berger Federal Courthouse in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Warren E. Berger Library at his alma mater Mitchell Hamlin School of Law formerly the William Mitchell College of Law, and the St. Paul College of Law at the time of Berger's attendance are named in his honor. <laughs> <laughs> Family and personal life He married Elvira Stromberg in 1933. 
They had two children, Wade Allen Berger (1936–2002) and Margaret Elizabeth Berger (1946–2017). Elvira Berger died at their home in Washington, D.C., on May 30, 1994, at the age of 86. Topic. See also. Demographics of the Supreme Court of the United States List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States by court composition List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States by education List of Law Clerks of the Supreme Court of the United States List of United States Chief Justices by time in office List of U.S. Supreme Court Justices by Time in Office United States Supreme Court Cases during the Burger Court